what are rights? Do rights even exist or they only exist in our heads? Is there such thing as human rights? What are the human rights? I'm exploring the philosophy of objectivism and today we're going to talk with Greg Salmieri about some of these concepts in this book, Foundations of a Free Society. So Greg, thank you for being with us. Um, some people claim nowadays that uh, rights don't even exist, that there are things that we have imagined, they only exist in our minds, but that actually there's no such thing as rights. So what would you say to those people? Well, that goes back a long way. It's not just these days, but even people who are seen as defenders of freedom, uh, like um, Jeremy Bentham and Mill said things like that. Uh, what are rights? I mean, I think they're real. I think they're based in human nature. But it's not a surprise that people doubt that they exist when uh, people make up rights to all sorts of things, a job, free health care. Yeah. And the people who try to defend uh, the more traditional conception of rights, uh, the conception associated with the United States' founding, uh, don't have much to rely on except religion when they turn back on it that God gave them to us. So I think it requires thought. Where, where do these come from? What is it about us that makes it right for us to live together in some ways and not others? Right. I was talking with Yaron Brook about uh, Harari, who has this proposal in his book, Sapiens, of rewriting the American Constitution. And he takes a part of rights out because he says, uh, let's face it, there's no thing, there's no such thing as rights in nature. There's something that humanity has come up with. But then Yaron said to me, yeah, sure. It's something that uh, humans have, you know, um, come up with in their minds. But the same you can say about mathematics, the same you can say about music, the same you can say about the, you know, physics, like it, it, it's, it's mechanisms that our mind, our brain uses in order to live in reality or explain reality. So even if rights is a concept that ex exists in human nature, that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, Rand has this distinction between, uh, a three-part distinction between which he calls the objective the intrinsic and the subjective. And mm -hmm. for something to be intrinsic is for it to just exist apart from the mind uh, totally. Uh, and for something to be subjective is for it to be made up. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people use the word objective for what she means by intrinsic, and they worry, is this something that's out in nature regardless of us, mm -hmm. or is it something we just made up, as though those were the only two options. Right. But most, or a lot of things, are neither of those two things. They're come up with by us, mm -hmm in a way that's based on facts that exist regardless of us. And that has to be come up with and worked out in a certain way uh, in order to stay true to those facts. And that's how, for example, mathematics or theories in science are. There are facts that are true whether or not we have the theory. And it's a good theory if it fits with the facts in the right way. And in a si similar way uh, in, in the case of rights, and in the case of morality more generally, because I think rights is just a part of morality, there are facts about human beings, about our biology, about what we need to live, about the fact that we live by reason and what it takes to live by reason and how people who are living by reason can succeed if they interact and how they'll fail if they interact. Mm. Uh, those facts exist before we have the idea of rights. And the idea of rights is a way of recognizing those facts and using them to guide our way of organizing societies. Right. And by that definition, then, uh, would you agree that to define what is a right from a necessity or a need that has been confused as a right. Because now people say, well, the right to housing, the right to education, the right to healthcare, I don't know, the right to a PlayStation or to a smartphone or the right to internet, whatever, uh -huh. whatever need you come up with uh, that you want, you can become it a right nowadays. And I think that a, a really good way of distinguishing what a right is from what is not is if you are born with it and you don't need anyone to give up anything for you to have it. So for example, the right to, to life. Mm -hmm. The fact that you're alive doesn't mean that someone else has to die. You are already alive. You just need no one killing you. Uh, the right to liberty, uh, the fact that you have the capability of being free to think, free to move, free to express yourself, to innovate, even to to come up with um, different ways of, of, of doing something that has never been done, that, that liberty doesn't mean that someone else would, would be deprived of their own liberty to do that. 
And also like the, the right to, pri to private property. I mean, the fact that you uh, have a right to your own body, to, to your thoughts, and also to the things you produce, mm -hmm. um, doesn't mean that someone doesn't. Is mm -hmm. that a good definition of what a right is? I don't think that it's a definition, but I think it is a good, I don't quite the word to use, test to know if you've gone wrong. Okay. That is, if you think you have a right to something, but someone else would have to provide it for you, for you to have it, uh -huh. uh, and so it has to get taken away from them, uh, well, then they can't have their rights if you have this right, and you know you've gone wrong. Right. So I think it's a really good test when you're thinking about what are rights. It, you're having them has to be compatible with everyone else is having the same right. And you can't have a right to be provided with something by someone. Uh -huh. um, so I definitely agree with that. And so a, a way to put it is if you have it by birth or naturally. But the way I think about it is that rights are about action. It's about you're free to take certain actions. And in particular, I think if, if we understand what a, the human way of living is, uh, how it is that human beings survive, and what's right about, uh, and, and how they ought to survive, but I think it's how they ought to survive is how they do survive. How we, all the things that we need uh, and want, but let's start with need, so food, water, water, shelter, things like that, and then on up to the PlayStation and the smartphone and the internet. Um, all of those kinds of things have to be created by action. Mm -hmm. and Rights are about the actions, not about the stuff. So it's about being free to take the actions to achieve your life and to achieve the various values that support your life. And then the rights to things, to property, are a derivative of that because your human beings live by taking action to produce the kinds of things we need to survive. You don't, life itself is a process of action, it's a doing. And a lot of the process of living for a human being is the creating the things we need, the conditions we need to keep surviving. And the rights to property are then the rights to uh, the fruits of your productive labor. You created something and now it's in, you're in charge of it. And that's how I think of it. So I think of it about action. And then if someone says, you know, healthcare is very important, mm -hmm. healthcare is something we need, I think, yeah, so then you need to be free to produce and trade it, yeah. not uh, free to grab it from whoever has it who had to produce and trade it. Now, what's the list of rights? What's the, the right list of rights? Because no one talks, when you ask people, what are the rights? No one says, oh, the right to think, the right to trade, the right to imagine, uh, even to, uh, you know, uh, fail, because you need failure in order to have also uh, some success in, in life, the right to trade. No one talks about rights anymore as actions that you are free to take from the coercion of others. So what would be the, that list? I mean, life, liberty, private property, and this liberty includes all those actions, right? Yeah, I would, at, at, if you, we want to list with a few items, yeah. I would say life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh -huh. And then there are other things that we could put under some of those headings. So free speech, free trade, yeah. I think are part of liberty. But at, at the basic level, I think there's just one. Uh -huh. There's the right to life. And the right to life here means the right to take those actions uh, that are needed to sustain oneself. A, a, a life is a process of self-sustaining, self-generated action. It's something you're busy doing. Yeah. And you, the right you have is to do that, and to do that in a way that doesn't interfere with anyone else's doing it. Mm -hmm. And then we think, well, what is that process for a human being? Well, it's, it's a process that's guided by his own thinking. And so he needs to be free. He needs to have the liberty to think what he wants and follow it in so, far as, so long as he's not doing it in a way that would interfere with someone else's life liberty. And that's the right to liberty, which includes free speech, free trade, and whatever. And then the right to property is, and what he does with his liberty, what he, the actions that he takes under the direction of his own mind is to create the kinds of things that he needs to sustain himself. Mm -hmm. The food, the shelter, either creates it directly or creates something that he trades for it and so forth. And so therefore you have the right to property. And then the pursuit of happiness is, um, what is this all for? What does this all add up to? Well, it's up to him, the individual we're talking about, to decide that. 
uh, and what is he going to make his life about? Again, consistent with his leaving that like liberty for everyone else. So that's where I think that list comes from. And that's that's exactly what uh, you say, uh, Fred Miller and Adam Musoff in, in, in the book, in page 120, just as life is the foundation for ethical theory, the right to life is the foundation of all rights. There is only one fundamental right, a, man right, a man's right to his own life. Life is a process of self-sustaining and self-generated action. The right to life means the right to engage in self-sustaining and self-generated action. Now, let me ask you something. Once I had a, a, a professor in university in, in the ethics class, and he comes in and he says, well, guys, what would you rather have? Would you rather be alive or would you rather be free? And we were all like... Uh, I don't know. So he's like, okay, raise your hand if you'd rather be alive. And half of the class, like, raise your hand, raise your hand if you'd rather be free. And he said, um, I'd rather be free than alive. So if someone would tell me that the rest of my life I'm going to spend it in a concentration camp, mm -hmm. I put my liberty as a priority than my life itself, and I'd rather be killed. And this is the reason why he said, uh, in the libertarian movement, there is a disparity in between people who uh, support abortion and people who don't. Because for some people, the life that still doesn't exist mm -hmm. has a priority from the liberty of the woman that already exists uh -huh. into having a right on her own body to make a decision. So do you believe that in, in those rights, life, liberty, private property, and the pursuit of happiness, there is a distinction in what comes first than the other? Um, in a way, but I don't know that you can pull life and liberty apart and choose between them in that way. Mm -hmm. And although I'm very much in favor of abortion rights, yeah. I don't think of them All the way... All objectivists are, right? There's no, like... like well, uh, Ayn Rand was a, a really strong a, a proponent of abortion rights, and uh -huh. so... I don't know if everyone who calls himself an objectivist is, but she was, and most ah, of us who are influenced you're gonna, you're by gonna, You're going to start having a narco-objectivist. No, I'm kidding. There <laughs> are people who call themselves everything, Jew, this objectivist, that objectivist, and I'm not uh, you know, here to be the name police, what they yeah, can call I themselves. Know, I know. But uh, I, I think Rand's position uh, on this was pretty clear, and I think she was right on it. Mm. So um, you can let the chips fall where they may terminologically. Yeah. But I don't think the right way to think about why abortion uh, is a right and why we should be free to have abortions or women should be free to have them is that freedom is more important than life because um, in that case, I mean, you know, suppose you get it into your head that you're better off having killed me or something like that. We could say your freedom is more important than my life, but that can't be right. It's, I think it really matters for the abortion debate that we don't think that the, the fetus is a, the kind of being that has rights. Rights pertain to individuals. Right. Individuals are things that are independent of one another, maybe not fully independent in the way two adults are, but at least spatially separate that you could act on one without acting on the other or vice versa. The rights are about how individual human beings relate to one another. And a fetus, even though it's, it has separate DNA and so forth, it's in a woman, everything she does affects it. Everything it does affects her. Everything you do to her affects it. It's not separate enough to be a distinct individual for the purpose of thinking about interaction yet. And it's not yet a human being in the sense of the term that's relevant for rights. And you were saying that this baby that doesn't yet exist. And I think it's important that it doesn't yet exist. If it did yet exist in the relevant sense, then it wouldn't be okay to kill it. But it doesn't. So, so as to, is life or liberty more important? Well, liberty is an essential of life. It's like asking, is life or food more important? Right. And if someone said, well, if I knew I was going to starve to death, I'd kill myself early in the process rather than wriggling through the pain of starvation, you wouldn't say that's because he loves food more than life. Um, that you can't really pull them apart. And I think the same way about life and liberty. I wouldn't want to live in a concentration camp. And I think the live free or die, which is the motto of New Hampshire, is, I think it's New Hampshire, one of the states is really good. There's a new Harriet Tubman movie coming out where she says she, you know, she's going to live free or die trying. And I think that's really admirable. But it's not because she values liberty more than life. I think it's she understands how essential it is to her life. Yes. That any kind of thing that is still her sticking around but not being free is in any kind of life and isn't therefore worth living. And, and because life is the origin and, and this, this is, uh, you, 
you put this in the book several times. Mm -hmm. Once you have a human life, that life has um, a mind that is capable of reasoning. And because of that reasoning, then other rights um, follow. Mm -hmm. And there is a, a definition of the right to trade. But trade is seen as knowledge. And it, it's very interesting in page 26, trade in a somewhat broader than usual sense the term encompasses both material exchange and personal relationships. Mm -hmm. Trade made possible the development of knowledge and material values on a vastly expanded scale in contrast with what, with what could be attained by one's own isolated action. Mm -hmm. To engage with others by trade is to participate in the process of development. Almost no one uh, tackles this point about freedom to trade as, or the right to trade as something that allows knowledge to keep expanding and existing. Mm -hmm. This is who we should say. This, um, this book's a collection of essays by different authors. I think this is Daryl Wright that uh, is, is yes, Darryl Wright. reading there. Um, but I definitely agree with, with Daryl's point on this. Um, the idea behind trade, and this is for him the trader principle, that we should interact with one another by trade, mm -hmm. is part of ethics. It's prior to politics. And maybe we should talk a little bit about this structure in a moment. But it's the idea that um, we each should be interacting with one another to mutual advantage by mutual consent. So I shouldn't be trying to uh, sacrifice to you to help you in a way that harms me. And I shouldn't be trying to get the best of you uh, to win our interaction so that you know I benefit and you lose by it. I should be going into it thinking um, the best kind of interaction to have, the one that will benefit me the most in the long run, is where we each benefit by it. And also, we should each think that's not going to happen and can't happen unless we both understand that that's what's happening and agree to it. So yeah. even if I know this would really be best for you, I can't impose it on you. And so trade is we act together voluntarily to mutual advantage by mutual consent. And that's true not just if you know I buy something from you and give you a few dollars and vice versa, but also if we're going to have a friendship, if we're going to do an interview together. We're both here because we both think we're better off because of it, and yep. we each think that. Uh, and likewise in a marriage or anything else. And it, it's in that kind of relationship that knowledge develops and gets shared. Right. Because otherwise I learn something myself, I don't tell you. It's, it's through this exchange of our ideas um, that we all learn more. And then when we have a market scenario in an, in an economy where people are living together by trade, uh, knowledge diffuses much more quickly in ways it couldn't possibly otherwise. And that's, um, you mentioned earlier Rob Tarr's piece at the end of the book mm -hmm. about uh, economics and how Rand relates to the Austrians. And one yeah. of the things Rob really stresses there is the kind of knowledge discovery that's possible in a free market that isn't otherwise. Mm -hmm. And the role of knowledge in the evaluating of things and how the price system functions as a result of that. And, and he thinks there's a, a key insight uh, about the role of knowledge and thinking in values that is kind of in Austrian econo economics but never been really spelled out. Mm -hmm. And that uh, Rand's view of value gives and, and of knowledge kind of spells it out the rest of the way. And, and there's a quote that says, reason cannot function under coercion. That's the importance of liberty. Uh -huh. that, that reason, which is the basic uh, uh, characteristic of human life, cannot function under coercion. And that's why humans, uh, instead of coercion, have persuasion. They have trade, which are peaceful means uh, to share knowledge and benefit from, from one another. It is life the only uh, characteristic that you need in order to have rights, because then uh, everything that is alive has rights, right? From, I don't know, a bacteria or a dog or a cow. What's the difference in between human rights and other uh, living beings? Yeah, so I don't, if you think of rights as just something that's part of your nature, mm -hmm. then you're thinking about like, well, what thing in your nature gives it to you? Is it your life? Is it your reason? Is it your this? And, and, and you think, if you're thinking about the abortion debate, for example, well, at what point does the fetus just get this thing? Yeah. Or does a dog have it? But the way I think about rights, is there a principle governing interactions among creatures that have reason? So I think of it as something that uh, you need reason and you need life, but it's not like life and reason give it to you. It's when you have a bunch of people each of whom is trying to lead his life by his reason. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And they recognize that reason can't function under coercion. And therefore they recognize that I need not to be coerced by the others. Mm -hmm. But they also recognize that everything I want from other people, everything I stand to benefit from them, they're only able to create and be of benefit to me because of their reason. And so if I try to put them into a situation of force, I'm killing the goose that lays the golden egg. I'm, I'm destroying the thing that I'm counting on to get my value from. Right. Um, when you realize that, you think, okay, well, how am I a creature with reason trying to lead my life and create things using my reason? And you, another creature like that, yeah. uh, how are we going to interact so that um, we can benefit from one another's interaction, but neither of us is having our reason undermined by force? How can rational creatures interact? What are the principles? And then w when you're in that situation, mm -hmm. you think, well, what we need is a way to recognize each person's freedom of action. And so Rand thinks of rights as principles defining and sanctioning freedom of action and individual's freedom of action in the social context. And the idea here is, in effect, I use my reason to make decisions that are going to guide the course of my life. You use your reason to make decisions that are going to guide the course of your life. When we're both acting, how do we figure out whose mind is in charge of what? Who, what, if there's a given decision to be made, how do we figure out if it's yours or mine? In some cases, maybe it's pretty obvious. What I eat is my decision, what you eat is your decision. Yeah. But, but once we're living near each other and we're interacting all the time in complicated ways, it can get confusing. I want to dig a hole here and you don't want a hole dug there. And well, we have to figure out where's the property boundary and what happened. And but, so what we need is a principled way to figure out what decisions are up to whom. Okay. What's your freedom and what's mine, given that we're living in the same place. And that's what rights are. And so they apply to rational creatures living in the same place and then trying to work out how to do it. So the relationship between moral principles and rights, mm -hmm. uh, how do you define those moral principles? So I think of moral principles as a wider category. There are moral principles that aren't rights. There are things I can do that would be wrong that have nothing to do with anyone else. Mm. Um, and there are things I can, so if I lie to myself and I'm irresponsible and so forth, um, I think I'm being immoral, but it's not, there's no one else involved in that immorality, at least not necessarily. And there are things that are immoral I could do to you. I could insult you in very unjust ways. Yeah. Uh, that would be wrong, and it would be wrong to you, but it's not an issue of your rights. Uh, so I think of rights as like a subset of moral principles. They're the moral principles about how we um, respect what choices are yours to make versus what choices are mine to make. And all the moral principles, I think, come, including rights, from understanding um, that each of us is an individual human being whose life is at stake in everything he does and who needs to use his mind in order to live. Yeah, and, and that's something that I think uh, objectivists and, and libertarians have in common when they, for example, denounce conservatives and socialists that sometimes uh, force you uh, to not use reason. Uh, and, and you talk about in the book of uh, two threats of force, those demanding action that could be, you know, like uh, under socialist regimes, mm -hmm. um, demanding action from you to, you know, uh, give away your, your private property or some liberties, but also those demanding belief. The fact that you uh, don't use your reason and believe something by dogma or even defend it violently by dogma, which might happen, I don't know, with like terrorists, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and those threats of force are always um, present, but not only, um, not only because a, a regime uh, implements them, but within society. So how do you manage, um, let, let me rephrase it, how, how do you manage the how do you safeguard your, your, your individual rights from people within society that might use action or belief uh, against your rights? If we're talking about an occurrence, like you know, some guy's charging at me with a knife or something, yeah. uh, how I safeguard them is I fight back as best I could in the moment and uh, I call the police right mm -hmm. on him. And I think we need police to deal with that, and we'll talk about that. And I think we also need to have the right to own whatever kinds of weapons and things are useful in these immediate self-defense scenarios. The right to bear arms. Yeah, and I don't think that implies necessarily the right to own any kind of arm, but I think the it right. does a handgun or something you can use in a self-defense situation. 
Um, but if we're talking about not, you know, if someone's charging at you right now, what do you do during the course of the emergency? But how do we do it on a broader level? Well, we need, rights are a principle about how a society should organize itself to protect the individual. Mm -hmm. And I think um, you need a government to do that and you need a population that understands about rights mm -hmm. uh, in order to uh, have the individuals in that population free. And the less the population understands about rights, the less freedom there will be able to be. And so I think the way you have to defend them if what you're talking about defending them against is people who are going to vote in horrible regimes or uh, defend against your country turning the way Venezuela has turned yeah. or the way Russia has turned it, or, uh, or what's happening in Hong Kong, is um, you have to really speak out and try to persuade people that these principles are true and that they matter. And the more people think it, the more they will uh, work together to create the kind of society that works with these principles. And, and also, I think, for example, uh, political correctness and safe spaces in college, and now mm -hmm. people saying that their, their right to not get offended is above your right to free speech uh -huh. and freedom uh, of expression, which is harming uh, like healthy debate. Because if someone claims, I have the right not to be offended and whatever I put in my mm -hmm. list that offends me should be banned or uh -huh. should be censored, you end up in a dictatorship, you know? Well, here I think this is where the idea of rights really comes in because rights are about, in effect, defining the sphere in which each person gets to decide. Mm -hmm. And so if you find something really offensive and you want to create a space where people can't do that thing, Uh, the, you, there are certain acts or words or topics that offend you and you dislike, and you want to buy a, a building and make post in the rules of the building, this doesn't happen here, nobody says this because it offends me. Whether it's good or bad that offends you, whether you're right or wrong about that thing, it's your right to set up that building because you bought it and you made the rules. Private property, and if, yeah. Yeah, and if someone sets up a college that way that he owns, uh, you know, whether we think it's a good policy or not, good for him, if he goes to your college that you set up, and says, you can't have the, the rules you want to have at your college right. because I have a right not to be offended. And my right not to be offended isn't a right to create the environments and spaces I want to create. It's rather a right to take over yours. Oh, uh, well, that's not a right. We're back to the place you can't have rights to violate people's rights. Right. And if someone wants to, for example, uh, dictate how YouTube functions, mm -hmm. either because they think YouTube allows things they wish weren't allowed on it, and they want to make it a safe space that doesn't allow those things, mm -hmm. or because they're mad that YouTube doesn't allow things that they want to say on it, but YouTube doesn't want them to say on it. Both of those are violations of rights. Right. And the rights is it's YouTube's, is YouTube's or it's Google's, yeah. and Google has to decide what the rules are. What's the relationship or the correlation and how they interact uh, the, between values, principles, goals, concepts? As, oh, as, that's a lot. Values, goals, principles, concepts? Yeah, because on, uh, also Daryl talks about it in, in, in page 36, like uh, how goals will, will come, like a pursuit of happiness, for example, like the purpose of your life will come once you have established, you know, the rights, the principles, and then you can have uh, goals and values in your life, uh, but also the importance of concepts, of, of precisely, I think, defining what I write is from what is not. So I think concepts pertain primarily to epistemology, which we talked about in the last, you know, the theory of knowledge. A concept mm -hmm. is sort of the kind of thought that's meant by a word, and it has to do with how you classify things. Yeah. And you need, I think, to classify things to understand and deal with them. And all of these other things, the word right, the word principle, the word whatever, are, are concepts. Now, um, values and goals are very closely related. You can define them so that they mean about the same thing. They're things you go after. Mm -hmm. But we, we tend to use goals when we're talking about a fairly concrete, specific thing you're going after. I want to get this job. Yeah. Um, I, I, I want to you know, make this much profit next quarter or whatever. These are my goals. Whereas your values um, are the more abstract things. Um, I want freedom. I want a, a flourishing career. And then your goals are, we usually use that word for the more concrete things under the values, the details. Mm -hmm. um, the way I think about it, uh, and then principles are uh, abstract, um, broad, 
pieces of advice of how to live, right? Or broad identifications of facts about the world, like principles in a science. But in ethics, how to live. So uh, here's how you should act. That's a principle, uh, if it's broad enough. Um, and the way I think about it is the, the um, principle of individual rights, the principle that says there's a sphere that's your action and I can't interfere with it, even if I think the action you're taking is wrong, even if I'm right that it's wrong, there's a sphere in which you're in charge and you can make your own mistakes or get it right and, and it's wrong of me to interfere in that. That principle, I think, depends on certain values. Okay. It depends on my... Uh, it depends on the fact that reason is a value, that human life is a value, mm -hmm. that reason is the tool by which human beings survive. Uh, these kind of core values that are at the center of ethics, I think, are part of the um, foundation for the principle of individual rights. But these core values and the principle of individual rights, I think, form the context in which each of us, if we're being rational, mm -hmm. chooses our specific values, our specific goals, our specific more detailed values. So it's not rational for me to choose as a goal something that involves violating your rights, getting your house right, right. or whatever, just like it's not reasonable for me to choose as a goal something impossible like flying by flapping my arms. Right. Um, the, 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 the basic values at the center of ethics and the principles that these values require to achieve them, like rights, uh, form the context that we use to figure out what goals are rational and achievable and how we can go about achieving them. And because of those irrational goals that I see all the time being implemented in Latin America, for example, when we talk about rights, uh, I always ask my audience, okay, give me the list. Mm -hmm. And then they start saying everything, housing, health, education. And then I start joking like, what about the right to PlayStation? What about the right to internet or to fashion shoes every six months? And then by, by doing this exercise, they start realizing how ridiculous they, they, they look at, uh, you know, uh, pushing for these unreasonable goals, right? Um, it's interesting to me that you use internet as one of these uh, reductio ad absurdum ones. Yeah. Because there are some people, I think, at the UN oh, who yeah, are thinking they that is a real yeah, yeah. They're, they're not up to fancy shoes yet, but internet... Yeah, they're... but internet is something that they want to make a human right in the Declaration, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. That's why we, we started the discussion saying, what are human rights, right? Because if we're, if we're the humans, <laughs> what are our rights? and trying to divide them from the needs that have been mistaken for rights. But um, one of the, of the fallacies or of the wrong premises that is used in Latin America is people are so weak and people are so poor that you cannot tell me that the only three rights are life, liberty, and private property because people need more things. You know, they, and, and not even only in Latin America. If you listen to Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, they will, t she will tell you the exact same thing. People are in such a weak position that you cannot only give them these three rights. But, but what I see that happens is that life is constantly violated every day in, in Latin American countries, private property, the same, Mm -hmm. And also your liberties, because you don't have then, as a consequence, the liberties to act as, as you wished, because your life and your property are always in danger. So by not having them, that minimum, people, of course, are in a weak position where they cannot be, you know, like the, 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 the main characters of their lives. Uh -huh. And what I try to tell people in Latin America is, listen, you cannot demand from a government that is not even capable of guaranteeing life, liberty, and private property, then it doesn't even do that thing and you want them to give you health and housing and this and that. I mean, where is the, the, the logical order? And it's because the foundations, the philosophical foundations are not well explained and, and, and people don't understand them. So how do we reverse that? How, how do we make people start thinking of rights is, is starting from actions that they can take? So one of the philosophical principles here that I think often goes missing from these discussions, it seems like it's what's gone missing in this Latin American context and uh, Ocasio-Cortez in America, and I don't think only her. I think um, lots of politicians on both sides of the aisle here. Um, is a lack of respect for causality. So if you think of all of these things, um, houses, PlayStation, the internet, medicine, food, they're all effects. What's the cause of them? Mm -hmm. And uh, people are, are, are thinking, I have a right to have this effect. 
without wondering what causes it. But what causes all of those effects are human beings. It's reason-guided, productive human action that's the cause of all of those things. Food doesn't just grow on a tree. Even when it does, someone's got to plant the tree. And even when it's a tree that no one planted, someone's got to discover, well, this one we can eat and then get it to other people, right? So all of these things, even the ones that in some sense do grow on a tree, don't grow on a tree, they come from human beings. They're fruits of our labor. And in particular, they're fruits of our reason-guided action. Human action, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. so um, you can't demand effects without thinking about their causes. Right. And you can't demand effect via a means that destroys the cause. And so if you say, I want health care, uh, and I'm going to get it by just taking, you know, in making a doctor do something he doesn't want to do, or taking money from people who don't want to give it and using it to pay a doctor, uh, but therefore denying them the liberty to decide and plan their own lives and how they're going to do things, what you're going to end up doing and what happens wherever these things are done is that the values are destroyed. There's um, Rand tells this story, it's a Russian folk story, about a, a pig that um, likes eating acorns. And it eats all the acorns that are on the ground underneath the tree. Mm -hmm. And then when it finishes them, it starts digging up and eating the roots of the tree. Mm -hmm. it's gonna, and, and the bird calls down to it, if you stupid pig, if you look up, you'd see where the acorns are coming from and you're destroying it. And the, the pig doesn't have this causal perspective. Yeah. And you need this causal perspective on all of those values. Think, where do they come from? What makes them possible? If we don't have them now in, uh, you know, this kind of Ecuador, Guatemala, Honduras, or America, we don't have enough health care that's affordable now. Where do these things come from? Right. And how do we create the conditions or preserve the conditions where people can create them? Because they come from people. But that's what I don't get, because in Latin America, since we were uh, coloni no, colonized by, by the Spanish conquista, there was no guarantee to private property. Every, everything was owned by the king. You guys in America rebelled against paying taxes to the king, and everything that was in your land was yours, private property, life, and, and the pursuit of happiness. So what I don't understand is if you have the foundations of a country uh, based on these individual rights, on these true human individual rights, how come you're having the same discussions that we're, that we're having down there, where if I go historically, okay, I, I, I can find that, for example, indigenous people, they didn't have a right to private property, or there were no liberties guaranteed. So how come, coming from completely different historical backgrounds, the conversation has turned to the same point? Well, yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I think the, the histories of our continents are separate, but not that separate, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so there were um, ideas that gave rise to the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. Those ideas took root in America, in North America, in a way that they didn't in South America, and they took root in the English-speaking world yeah. in a way and at a time when they hadn't in the Spanish-speaking world. But it's been a long time since then, and things have been translated, and there are the universities in South America teaching some of these ideas and so yeah. forth. So the ideas have spread across countries and across, um, across borders. Um, but the ideas were never all the way understood and all the way accepted even in North America. Right. And the, um, the examples of uh, the mistreatment of certain Indian tribes, um, the, certainly the, the enslavement of African Americans, that women didn't have the vote. And there were all kinds of ways, even at the founding of America, where uh, things were not done in keeping with these principles. Right. Um, and there are ways in which we've improved in our understanding and implementation of the principles. We've gotten rid of those things. Uh, but there are other ways in which we've gotten worse. Your understanding doesn't sit still of a certain of idea. A, a person's doesn't and a culture's doesn't. Mm -hmm. You have to think and try to get deeper and try to apply it more consistently or it atrophies and, in, in, and becomes confused and distorted. And in, in certain respects, we've gotten better on these, but in other respects, we've gotten to understand rights less than the people did at the founding, less than they did at the period uh, in the 19th century when slavery was overturned. And um, certain wrong ideas of them have proliferated. And in America, they've kind of overwritten and eroded the foundations of what we had yeah. in North America. In, in Latin America, a mix of the good and the bad ideas reached you at around the same time, and that's why we're having the same discussions. And I should say one more thing about that. The, uh, one has to sort of think about how can I be more consistent? What's the deeper facts behind these ideas? Yeah. For any ideas you have, 
if you rest content with an incomplete understanding, it distorts. And one of the things that's implicit in America's founding um, is the is well, individualism is explicit, mm -hmm. and egoism. The idea that it's right to live for the pursuit of your own happiness, yeah. that it's right to live for yourself. This is what we were talking about in the last session that Mike Humer thinks is a hard sell. Yeah. And it's true, it is a hard sell. And people accepted it implicitly and at some level, but not all the way and not articulately. And to really make fully good on what America was about and what capitalism was about and what freedom is about, people had to dig deeper on this, think, what does it mean that my life is mine? What does it mean to live for myself? What other of the views I was taught with or that I inherited from religion right. have to go and change if this is true? And what does it mean to really be about valuing life on earth and valuing your own life? And to really do that consistently, I think, is to move to an egoistic philosophy, to move to a philosophy that's a lot more like objective, that is ultimately objective, I think it's the... And people were afraid to do that. It requires overturning a lot of what you've been brought up with it requires rejecting a lot of things from altruism and from religion. Yeah. And that people weren't willing to do that, I think, is a cause of the atrophy that we've had here. And also the competition is not fair because you're competing with systems that rely on taxes to perpetuate the altruism from the government side. And you're competing against churches and, and religions who also get all these huge amounts of money so like you, it, it's a it's it's a unfair competition you're trying to do this battle of ideas with you know like private resources whereas these huge machineries are already established throughout the centuries to implement this this kind of mentality in an uh, adoctrination kind of way right i think that's true particularly of established churches and mm -hmm. of the university systems right. which are established by the country but i think bigger than the um, any particular established institution is just how deeply baked into our thinking uh, our philosophical ideas are, our perspective on morality, from how you're brought up in the crib, about you know, you should share and don't be selfish, yeah. and so forth. And those kinds of ideas, and particularly the stigma against selfishness, which uh, goes back, I mean, really to antiquity, but the particular form that this is the kind of essence of, of immorality is right. being about yourself. I think Kant is the real, uh, the, the 18th century philosopher Immanuel Kant is the real, the person who made this center of the page for ethics. Um, and that, that is what happened at the moment in history where we needed a kind of intellectual revolution to complete the political revolution of the American Revolution. Instead of that, instead of the kind of egoistic, this worldly, pro-reason philosophy that we needed that would complete the kind of Aristotelian philosophical perspective. Which is what you talk about in the introduction, that we have advanced in technology, in science, in biology, in our quality of life, but philosophically, eh, all these ideas had some kind of importance, okay, during the American Revolution and the 19th century, what we need to, to like catch up with uh, with like our advancements in quality of life and material advancements with our mental advancements yeah. with a philosophy that can support that and there was this particular time in the in the 18th century and early 19th century when we had to go the rest of the way yeah. uh, if 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 the intellectuals of that time had taken it up and gone the rest of the way yeah. had gone more towards the direction that Ayn Rand later pointed us in yeah. I think it would have been possible to maintain and sustain an ever-growing freedom in the world. But the ideas that prevailed then took us in the opposite direction. And since then, we've had this competition between the Aristotelian Enlightenment elements in our society yeah. and these Kantian, duty-based, anti-individualist elements. And we're seeing that play out in, uh, in all of our countries. I like the quote that you use in the introduction. If one wishes to advocate a free society that is capitalism, and we already explained why, freedom to trade, freedom to think, one must realize that it is indispensable its indispensable foundation is the principle of individual rights. If one wishes to uphold individual rights, one must realize that capitalism is the only system that can uphold and protect them. Once you have this clear, it is easy to look at any legislation and think, this legislation will advance individual rights, whereas this piece of legislation will um, harm individual rights, which I think is also um, 
one of the things that has us so confused nowadays. People don't know what the, the law is for or what the law should, should legislate. And I like a lot a quote of Frederic Bastiat where he says, the law is not about telling you how to think, what to write, uh, who to visit, or what to sell, or how to behave. The law is just a mechanism so whatever you do doesn't interfere of the freedom of someone else acting as, mm -hmm. as they want to. And if we just have this clear, then all the pieces of, of legislation, the thousands of them, become very clear which are the ones that should cease to exist from the ones that, that should continue. I think, I think that's right. And that, that passage from Bastiat that you allude to, mm -hmm. I think is very much the kind of view of rights we were talking about before. Yeah. What a right is about. It's about telling uh, what your freedom is and where it, you know, so that other people maintain the same freedom. Um, I think it's true, without that understanding, the laws are, you can't make any sense of them. You can't tell which there should be and which there shouldn't. And what you get is pressure group warfare. This group thinking, well, I'm a steel worker, so having this law would help my industry. And this other guy thinking, but I work in a field that uses steel, so having this other law would. And it's just tribes, clans warring with each other, basically. Lobbies. And yeah, people lobbies. thinking that that is capitalism, exactly. which is the most annoying thing of them all. Like when, when there are lobbies pushing for privileges and people tell you, you see, that's why capitalism doesn't work. And you're like, no. What that actually is is anarchism. Exactly. Anarchism is gangs competing who has mightier. For more power. But I, the, I want to say, just about, yeah, yeah. I think when you have the principle of rights clear, you can then look at the laws and figure out which are right and which are wrong. It's not always easy. There could be cases where it's hard to figure out just what the statute of limitations on something should be, just what the voting aid should be, just um, how we should determine boundaries of certain properties. What about IP? It's not that sort of it's a piece of cake or it's child's play. Yeah. Once you have this principle done, there are still hard questions. But without this principle down, it's hopeless. Yeah. And you're reduced to these gangs. So Greg, thank you so much for clarifying all these questions. I, I want to end with um, a kind of like hypothetical scenario uh, regarding animal rights. I don't, I don't know if you remember the movies Planet of the Apes of the 70s, yeah. where you know uh, apes evolve. Uh -huh. into a point where they also have the faculty to, to be rational and demand their rights. Um, what would happen if any animal form would achieve some kind of reasoning? Uh, does the, then that species also become a subject of rights? And if so, would they need to speak it, express it, or, or how would that work? So now we're in science fiction, of course. Yeah. But I think what you would need for the issue of rights to come up is for these animals to have the same features that give rise to them in humans and to be able to interact with human beings in more or less the way we interact with one another. Okay. So if you have an, an animal that instead of living by repeating by rote the same pattern that it has for generations and generations is able to think and it has to live by thinking and figure out new ways to live and new ways to make things and they're able to in some sense communicate that to one another that that's what they're doing and communicate to us that that's what they're doing then suddenly this animal would be able to produce things that were tremendous value to us mm -hmm. The things we create would be of tremendous value to them. There'd be this ever-increasing way in which we could benefit one another. And moreover, uh, we would be necessarily at war with one another uh, if we uh, tried to treat them as though they weren't creatures like that, but were just the way all the other animals are right now. Yeah. And uh, so it's just at that point where they can communicate with one another and with us. Yeah. And that this not be they speak, maybe they communicate in some other way, but there's some way for us to try to persuade one another, yeah. and they are living by reason as we are, uh, when those conditions are met, then I think the principle of rights would apply. And if you watch science fiction, you find that there are a lot of stories, like, like the Starship Enterprise, one of its computers becomes alive, and someone thinks it's alive, and someone doesn't, and then it starts talking to them. And I think you know they don't believe in rights in the Star Trek future, but um, the kinds of considerations that come up are relevant. Can we like try to make a deal with this thing? Yeah. Can we say, you know, I see you don't want me here, I won't, don't want this. Well, what if we do it this way? And once that's possible, then the context for rights arises. 
Now, before that point comes, uh, what should be the proper ethical treatment of animals from human beings towards them? Well, so as I said earlier, I think a lot of ethics is not about rights. It, it's, uh, rights is about whose decision should it be. Okay. Um, now, as far as animals, I don't think they have rights, but it's wrong to uh, try to cause them pain for no reason. So I think any kind of, um, any kind of, um, and this is a big subject, but any kind of activity you would do that the, the point of the activity to you is the kind of pain you're causing the animal. What is that coming from in you that you just get off on an animal being tortured? Uh, it's, it's coming from something that I think is kind of vicious and wicked and sick in a person. Uh, something that's bad for the animal, but bad for the person acting that way. Yeah. And bad for other people around him. And I think he, if I saw someone acting that way, I'd think ill of him. I think this person needs help and should get it. You should recognize this is wrong with him. Now, if we put aside that, the sadistic type of person, there are situations in which do you want animals to have healthier, happier lives or, or less healthy, less happy lives? Yeah. And I think all things being equal, I want the animals and the plants around me for that matter to be healthier and to be thriving and doing well because they're living things like me and I have fellow feeling for them. But that's one value among many for me. And if, um, if uh, something that it, you know, benefits me or benefits other human beings by harming a plant, or an animal, I'm all for it. And most of the plants or animals that human beings benefit from, exploit, you know, only exist because we're doing that. It's not like potatoes would be doing really great if there weren't human beings uh, growing potato plants, or there just wouldn't be any potato. And the same goes for pigs. Right. Uh, so uh, I think needless cruelty, senseless cruelty to them is, I think, wrong. Uh, I'm not convinced that our current farming practices and things like that are immoral, though I'm sure you can find some farmer somewhere who's doing something bad. Yeah. Okay. Greg, thank you very much. I hope that this discussion has clarified what are human rights, why do they exist, and what differentiates human rights from uh, needs that we think it should be rights. Uh, stay tuned because we will come with more of these sessions.